QCF, how are you doing? It's always weird hearing your, hearing your bio, you're like, is that me? I don't know who that guy is, actually. <laughs> so those of you who don't know who I am, my name is William Matthews. Um, I know because I met so many of you, and you're like, who are you? I'm like, thank you. I need that humility in my life. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, Bacola, and I want to thank Christopher Dowling for even thinking of me to invite me to this conference. I don't know if they're here right now, but everyone give it up for them. Also, are you guys uh, emotionally exhausted yet? <laughs> I was talking to some, uh, some women in the cafe earlier, and they were like, I have brain fog. <laughs> Who said that to me if you're here? Where are you at? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, we were talking about that. Uh, you know, COVID, our brains don't quite, they don't feel as elastic as they used to be. Um, a little bit about me real quick before we get into the keynote tonight. Uh, I grew up son of a pastor, uh, Church of God denomination. Church of God, yay, thank you. But not Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, Anderson, Indiana. Anyone know that one? Very niche, a very segregated denomination if you know the history of it. Uh, my grandfather was a missionary to the Barbados, him and my grandmother. My father and aunts and uncles are ordained ministers and pastors. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, moved to Raleigh North. Hey, it's cold in the D. Cold in the D. Okay, the only Detroit people know that one. Uh, I grew up kind of in a holiness uh, move. They called it a movement, not a denomination, but functionally it was a denomination. You know that languaging. And my parents grew up so holiness that when they got married, jewelry was considered a sin. So they got uh, married to wedding watches. They exchanged them to each other. Yeah, that's how holiness we were. But we were holiness without the Pentecostal, so I didn't get to speak in tongues. <laughs> I, we were black, so we sang and danced a little bit, but not too much. You know, we, we're not charismatic. We're not Pentecostal. I think my grandfather, no, my uncle told me the story once of how my grandfather used to con, uh, argue with people and convince them not to speak in tongues and how it was demonic. <laughs> Which, for some of you, you probably still believe that, so that's great. Um, sorry, I just uh, realized that. Some of you are like, tongues, what are these things? <laughs> uh, I'm a singer-songwriter by profession and trade. Uh, I decided not to become a pastor, mainly because, you know, I left that to my dad and grandfather, and I wanted to become a musician. My mother was a choir director, and she used to lead the choir, and that's kind of where I got my start in music. Um, I released an album four years ago called Cosmos. Some of you might have heard that album. Yay, Cosmos fans in the house. It's a great record. It's a masterpiece, I keep saying. <laughs> Hoping that'll catch on eventually. <laughs> it's a, I said on the Liturgist podcast once, I was like, this is my masterpiece. And then everyone's been coming to me, it is a masterpiece. I'm like, see, this is why I said it. Uh, so who, a fan of the Liturgist podcast in here? Anyone that's been? Yeah, 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 Liturgist fans. Uh, so yeah, that was a fun ride. Uh, I also was a part of a record label called Bethel Music. Some of you have ever heard, and maybe you've heard some of that music. Whew, mixed reactions. I just felt the stiffness in the room. Well, I'm, I'm not really going to talk about that part of my life, but I do want to say uh, it was great until it wasn't. <laughs> like most things, all good things must come to an end. Uh, but I don't know in this crowd, I feel like this. I've been here the last four days and kind of been feeling everyone out. How many people here by show of hands would you say you probably have some type of actual religious trauma when it comes to worship music? Raise your hands. Okay, a lot of you. So uh, I spent most of my adult life as a worship leader, and as a worship leader, I got to travel the world, uh, record albums, do the whole thing, and I know more than anyone else that worship leaders can be some of the most manipulative people <laughs> on the planet. So if you raised your hand, would you mind standing up for a moment? Be brave. We don't do safe spaces, we do brave spaces. I want to stand in proxy for any worship leader in your life that has ever manipulated you, ever coerced you, ever used emotionalism to diminish you, to humanize you, to force you to give something that you weren't prepared to give. And I want to say that I'm sorry. And I want to say that I'm sorry for, my, for things that I've done in the past, for ways in which I've led to just get a reaction out of you and to not actually honor your process and honor your journey just to make me feel good. Because I know if I sing that one song, I'm going to get your hands up. 
and that makes me feel good, and it's not about what's actually good for you. And I want to own that, actually, and I want to own that to anyone that's ever been to a concert I've done in the past. (laughs) I'm sorry, y'all. No, actually, they weren't all bad, but, like, legitimately, I really am sorry. And I want you to know that part of my reclaiming journey has been to do things like this, but also to find new ways to lead, non-coercive ways to lead. And I'm committed to that. And if you ever see me leading and it feels coercive, please come tell me. Um, Actually, I want to sing a song over you if that's possible. You don't have to worship. You don't have to lift your hands. You don't even have to sing along. But if you do sing along, great. Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. And blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like the sky of falling stars. And blessed are the wounded ones in mourning, brave enough to show the Lord their scars. And blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. And blessed are the ones who walk in kindness, even in the face of great abuse. And blessed are the deeds that go unnoticed, serving with unguarded gratitude. And blessed are the ones who fight for justice, longing for the coming day of peace. And blessed is the soul that thirsts for righteousness, welcoming the last, the lost, the least, the kingdom. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more, this is not the end. Hope is in the Lord, keep your eyes on Him. Because blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fuck. Salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Sing it if you don't. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior.
I want to unpack something tonight. Um, I don't know about you, but life has felt so different post-pandemic. I know we're still in it, right? But, but really much post-quarantine. Um, I probably haven't spoken a sermon since 2019. So I'm a little rusty. But um, I feel like ever since 2019, pretty much ever since that 2020, uh, I don't know if y'all remember how crazy 2020 was. <sighs> y'all. Yeah, somebody's like, what happened? <laughs> Where have you been, sir? <laughs> Ever since 2020, you know, someone, so many of us got radicalized in 2016, right? You know what I'm talking about. And we began to be very conscious towards justice leading up to 2020. But ever since 2020 uh, and, the, and the George Floyd protests and everything that was going on with COVID and the election, um, I've been yearning again for something that I haven't been able to name. And so if you guys will give me the freedom for a few minutes this, tonight, I want to try to unpack something. And honestly, I'm feeling at the beginning stages of this, so give me some grace on this. But I feel like God's doing something different. The scripture that I'm using tonight is Ephesians 2, 13 through 22. If you could put it up on the screen, I'm going to read it to you. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made of us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. I'm going to say that again. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together. I'll say that again. In him, you are also be being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The title of my uh, message today is called Building Beloved Community. I also like to call it God's BBC. My God. Real quick, can I take a side note? I would like to encourage all the uh, gay men in the audience for a moment, um, particularly my white gay brothers, to let Building Beloved Community be the only BBC you reference. Because to objectify and fetishize black men and their members is racist. Black men and our diverse body types are not here solely to please you. And that goes for everybody. So in 2023, let your New Year's resolution be to lose that phrase. And if you say it, only reference God's building a beloved community. You can clap. QCS, I believe that the primary purpose of the gospel is to bring every human being into an intimate knowledge of their belovedness. I was a fan of uh, Iyanla Van Zandt's Fix My Life. I don't know if any of you watched that show on Oprah's network. She'd always be like, beloved. <laughs> I love it. Beloved. You are beloved of God. Not on my watch. <laughs> belovedness. As a Christian, we are all taught John 3, 16, the most quoted verse in the Bible, say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that this means that the world and all therein is beloved by God. I'll say it again. This means the world and all therein is beloved by God, including the people you hate including the people who oppress you, including the people who resist you. 
We see in the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve of Jesus' death, he announced in his high priestly prayer, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Keep them in your name, all of us, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, Jesus, a faithful Jew, Jesus was a faithful Jew, trained in the way of the Torah and the prophets, was well-versed in his own belovedness and the belovedness of all humanity. You see this, and it's made clear at his own baptism, when the sky parted and the thunder rolled and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Let that be the voice you hear tonight. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. This voice wasn't just alone. This voice didn't come just in a vacuum. It actually came from the, the Torah. It came from the text. It came from the Psalms. Psalm 18, 19 says, he brought me into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Or as another version says, he delivered me because he delighted in me. Psalm 149, 4, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Isaiah 62, 4 says, you shall no longer be termed forsaken. Queer people, you shall no longer be termed forsaken. And your land shall no longer be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her. And your land married, for the Lord delights in you. Psalm 46, 5, one of my favorites. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. A holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. And what? Come on. Yes, Bible scholar. See, I'm used to the charismatic space. They kind of know these all on like repeat. It was so easy to lead in that space. It was just very simple. (laughs) Okay, my last one, my personal favorite too, Zephaniah 317, which says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will dance over you with loud singing. Or other translations say, he violently spins over you. God violently spins over you. God is delighted in you. You are God's beloved. I believe that scripture clearly gives us a vision for the beginning and the end of all things. We know the end of the story. It's belovedness expressed through cohabitation and community. That's where this is headed. We see in the book of Genesis where humanity is placed in a garden. This garden was a place of belonging, friendship, and communion with God and nature. We've divorced that, but it's both. Most importantly, it was a home. Humanity has since left that garden, and yet it seems that this desire for homeness still sticks with us. And it's also a desire I believe we're being led back into. Home within oneself, home within nature, home with animals, with floral life, with sea and land, and home with relationship with one another. QCF, I'm here to propose to you tonight that the cosmos has a trajectory, that the universe has a moral arc, as Dr. King would say, That what started in a garden is ending in a city. I'm going to say that again. What started in a garden is ending in a city. A beloved community that spans the divide of space and time. How do we know this? Revelation 22, 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city. A new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from his eye. Remember that Kirk Franklin song? Every tear. (laughs) Preach, preacher. And death will be no more. 
Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have what? Passed away. We're going from glory to glory, y'all. From faith to faith, from strength to strength, from grace to grace. The way we are right now will not be who we are. The revelation we have right now will not be what we're walking into. We're moving from glory to glory. We're never a stuck people. We're a people of exodus and exile who are on the move. A people on the move. See, I believe that God takes joy when we love ourselves. 2020 taught me self-care. God takes joy when we love ourselves because to love ourselves is to love God. I'm going to say that again. To love ourselves is to love God. I quote Ian Van Zandt again. <laughs> you are the representative of God in your own life. How you treat you is how you treat God. You are the representative of God in your own life. God also takes joy in our communion with each other, our laughter, the warmth, and the safety of our touch. These acts of love are the tabernacle of praise that God makes God's home in. We are only as attractive as our love for one another. So I believe beloved community starts with self-care and self-love. We have to become full within ourselves before we can invite others into places of rest and communion. I'll say that again. We have to become full within ourselves before we can invite others into places of communion, rest, and belovedness. I believe there are three stages of belovedness. Acceptance, invitation, and community. I'm going to get black church for a moment. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am accepted in the beloved. Turn to another neighbor and say, neighbor, I am accepted in the beloved. Turn to one more person and say, neighbor, you are accepted in the beloved. Ooh, all right, y'all. I felt that when you said it. Okay, so many of us know this journey of acceptance. Actually, honestly, if you're here tonight, you've, you're on this journey of acceptance. <laughs> so many of us know this journey of acceptance because coming to terms with the reality of your unique sexual expression and gender identity requires radical acceptance. It requires radical acceptance of what simply is. Anyone mature and confident in who they are and how they love knows that we must Suffer, that we suffer most when we deny, ignore, and diminish the plain reality of what's right in front of us. We suffer when we ignore, deny, and diminish the plain reality of what's right in front of us. The truth is you and all your queer glory are called to live the full human experience in this body, in this time, in this place. Yes, amen to that. The process of humanness is also a process of divine sanctification in which Christ is working through the processes of our own personal, social, and physical evolutions, bringing us into communion and community with ourselves and one another. How many of you in your lives were brave and took a risk by coming out to friends and family only to be greeted with some version of this? Oh, baby, we already knew. Raise your hand. Yeah, it's okay. You, did you feel like the steam was taken out of you a little bit? <laughs> like you've been working up your whole life to just say who you were, and then they were like, girl, we knew. <laughs> it's almost as if the people in your life were just waiting for you to come home to yourself so that they can be in right relationship with you and in full community with you. I love St. Irenaeus who says, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. The glory of God is the human being fully alive. But it's a journey. As Beyonce stated in her film, Black is King. Yes, all right. The journey is a gift, something to offer to the door to the rooms of your mind. This is how we journey far and can always find something like home. I want everyone to take a deep breath for a minute. And I want you to say this out loud. 
I am welcome to come home to myself. See, belovedness is first and foremost about that divine acceptance within yourself of who you are. Like, do you know what girl you are? Do you know what dude you are? Do you know what they they are? (laughs) Do you know? Because if you did, we wouldn't be begging for so much acceptance from others. Acceptance starts first with yourself. Belovedness starts first here. Why? Because I am, I am delighted in my God. Whether my family accepts me, whether they reject me. We used to sing this song in the, uh, in the church where it was like, and if my mother and my father forsake me, yeah, then the Lord will raise me up when I need some help and can't find nobody else. I don't even know this song. Three, I love it. <laughs> I'm deep church, y'all. Y'all were like, I don't know that song, you know. I grew up, honestly, even, even in a non-affirming space, I grew up with this understanding that my belovedness and my worth was attached to God and not the people around me. Because d- God is that divine spark that lives inside of each and every one of us that creates delight, pleasure, fun, and belovedness. Because before we can ask others to do anything, to do justice, to walk in mercy, we have to first represent belovedness and extend belovedness to them. Step two, invitation. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is inviting me deeper. Turn to one more neighbor and say, neighbor, God is inviting you deeper into belovedness. Dr. Martin Luther King said that the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. So that when the battle is over, a new relationship comes into being between the oppressed and the oppressor. Moving forward, I want to define queerness real quick. Um, I'm not defining this. I'm just going to read what dictionary.com said. (laughs) Because I can't define. Dictionary.com says the word queer means to be strange. Odd. From a conventional standpoint unusually different. When I was a kid, I used to read X-Men comic books, and one of the comic lines was called The Uncanny X-Men. Any X-Men fans in here? Yes. Let's pray for uh, uh, Pastor Kevin Feige that he does this right, bringing the X-Men into the MCU. Can I get an amen? I believe in him. Lord bless Bishop Feige. (laughs) Give him the revelation and the wisdom to do the X-Men right, because Fox did not. Uncanny, unusual, different. You are queer if you're uncanny, unusual, different, strange, odd. Ephesians 2, strangers and aliens, foreigners, as Hebrew says. The meaning also represents suspicious, shady, and not the housewife shady. A person whose sexual orientation or gender identity falls outside the heterosexual mainstream or the gender binary. Historically, queer has meant strange in the way that departs from convention. Since the early 20th century, it has also had the meaning of just gay or lesbian. Any of you uh, grew up in a time where act to be called queer was actually a slur? Yay, nay, yeah, some of you. Much of that time, it's been used disparagingly with the intent and perception of being insulting. Since the 1980s, queer queer has been increasingly adopted, especially among younger members of the gay community, as a positive term of self-confidence. Anyone here uses queer positively? I guess you would, because you wouldn't be at a conference called Queer Christian. (laughs) So I'm preaching to the choir. Amen. However, you know, that term is honestly not universally accepted, right? It's not, and that's fine. Same way, you know, certain black people don't mind saying the N-word, and some do. Just don't do it as a white person. I'm watching some of you. I see y'all at the hip-hop concerts. I'll be watching. (laughs) Better not say it. Better not say it. Queer is also a term used by activists and academics, queer politics, scholar of queer literature. The term has been more recently uh, mean to come into include a person, you know, whose gender rights, like I said earlier, sexual identity is outside the norm of heterosexuality. 
And more broadly within academia, to queer, which I actually love that phrase, to queer, can even refer to act of interpreting a text using a non-normative or marginalized perspective. I think this whole weekend, people have been queering the Bible, yeah? And we love it, don't we? We love it. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, I should just tell, I'm going to tell, this, I'll, I'll just say who it is. Uh, Y'all know who Lisa Gunger is? She's the sweetest human being on the planet. Lisa Gunger told me this story years ago, and it just stuck in my mind. She was talking to a family member, you know, just about, you know, something political, I think, like something that, why she believed, you know, something. <laughs> and this person uh, with a deep Southern accent looked at her and said, well, now you sound like you, you sound like the gays. <laughs> And it's that phrase. Literally to this day, me and Lisa would be like, she'll say something like progressive, and I'll be like, Lisa, you're sounding like the gays. <laughs> be careful. That's the slippery slope. You don't want to be like the gays. <laughs> but the reason I love that phrase, queerness, is because I believe that queerness is an invitation to holiness. What I mean by holiness is wholeness. Like I said, divine sanctification. God is bringing the cosmos through a process. Your queerness is not something strange or, or odd or, or distant. It's actually the very doorway into the very heart of God. Your queerness is the doorway into the very heart of God. Not just for you, but for the world around you. As I said earlier, I don't believe in safe spaces. I believe in brave spaces. And here's why. Because even in a gathering like this, that feels mostly relatively safe, not every single person here will probably feel safe for many different reasons. Queer is a broad label, like we said. It can mean anything gender non-conforming to gay, lesbian, and, and, and the alphabet community. Um, it can mean all those things. So there are people here, I imagine, who honestly, maybe you don't feel fully safe here. And that's okay but we get to do brave space. Mickey Scott, Bay Scott Jones, I don't know if you know who she is, she coined that phrase, we don't do safe spaces, we do brave spaces. There's nothing wrong with safe spaces. You might need a safe space to learn your own belovedness, but eventually we need to move towards brave spaces where we begin to share communal life with those who are different from us. Just because you're in a queer space doesn't mean you're safe. Your particularity within queerness is a starting place, not a finishing place. Paul understood this when he said, there are no distinctions between slave or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, all are one in Christ. I guess what I'm sort of getting at here, and I feel like I'm just dancing around a lot of things here, but the thing I'm getting at is the very thing that we've often been afraid of in embracing queer identity is the very doorway like I said, into the heart of God, but it's also into a revelation of where this thing is headed. God is building a beloved community. For a long time, queer people weren't esteemed as part of that beloved community, but the culture's changing. And even more slowly, the church is changing. So where is this headed? Is this headed into more safe spaces just for queer people or more safe spaces for black people? Or is it headed into how do we share communal life together? Because I have something to tell you, the racists aren't going anywhere. The bigots, they're not necessarily going anywhere. So the question I have, and it's just a question, knowing that we're moving into beloved community, how do we heal from the trauma of the past? How do we heal from the oppressiveness of what's been done to us? And also figure out a way in that process to begin to share communal life with those who are different from us. And that might be offensive, actually. And maybe in your process in this moment in time, that is offensive because those people hurt you and you want nothing to do with them. I get it. I just had to send a text the other day and said, I don't want nothing to do with those people. I will not show up to your wedding. <laughs> you create your boundaries, right? I had to do that. Love this person, will not show up to their wedding for various reasons, not because of them. You create your boundaries. And yet I feel challenged, even in my own particularity, to say, where is this thing headed? More safety or more braveness? As Christians, I don't think we get to quite choose that. <laughs> if you're not a Christian, fine. But I think as Christians, we don't get to choose whether we believe in reconciliation or not. 
As Christians, I don't know if we get to choose whether we believe in forgiveness or not. As Christians, I don't know if we get to choose whether redemption is a thing or not. I'm not saying it has to happen in a particular time frame, because this thing is cosmic. We got time, baby. We got time. And some of this will be generational. Some of this healing and reconciliation and work will be generational. We're not going to heal racism in a generation. We're not going to heal homophobia in a generation. It'll probably take two or three. But where are we going? What's the tell us here? Where are we moving? George Floyd happened, and where are we moving? Matthew Shepard happened how many years ago, and where are we moving to? Where are we going, y'all? Martin Luther King said, but in the end is reconciliation. In the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It is this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers and oppressors into friends. This type of love that I stress here is not eros or a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, but a phileo not phileo, a sort, not a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in lives of all men. This, Martin Luther King said, is the love that may very well be the salvation of civilization. So as queer people, any marginalized person, You've been given a gift. You have been given entryway, the first entryway into the doorway of wholeness, of cosmic reconciliation, of cosmic belovedness. Queer people are not trailing. They're the forefront and the leaders of restorative justice, of rehabilitation. Yeah? That's good. I believe that queer identity is the very thing in our society, excuse me, I believe that queer identity, the very thing in our society that carries so much stigma and shame can be our entryway into our own belovedness and God's beloved community. In fact, the reason there is stigma and shame regarding traditionally marginalized identities is because the revelation of our unique differentiation within humanity forces those around us to learn how to live with their own differentiation. You got to understand to be queer means you're a witness, you're a signpost, you're a miracle, you're somebody else's miracle because when you show up fully yourself, like I said, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. When you show up fully yourself, you open the door for other people's to be fully alive. You open the door for other people to wrestle with their own humanity, with their own inhumanity, with their own apathy, with their own hate, with their own prejudice, with their own bigotry. You showing up as yourself, fully beloved in your spaces, brings the kingdom of heaven, which is what? This other reality of belovedness coming to earth. This unity, this cosmic unity coming, flowing through in all of us. Simply put, highlighting our racial, sexual, and class differences doesn't create division. It deepens our connections and bonds with each other, strengthening and uniting our shared humanness. Y'all, we have been living in a culture war that has been telling us to bring up issues of race, class, and sexism as Marxists. It's, uh, what are the other ones they say? So, somebody said it, sorry. Critical race theory. Wokeness, what do they call it now, right? They just keep changing the vernacular, the woke mind virus, whatever. Like, it's ridiculous, y'all. Y'all know it's ridiculous. But the reason they do this thing is because they're refusing to face their own humanity. But you're a signpost. You're a sign and a wonder. You're a revelation of a future reality that has yet to be made manifest here on this earth. Yeah. Y'all got to learn to clap for yourselves, because listen, they're not going to give it to you. The world will not give it to you. You clap for yourself. You support yourself. You are beloved. Yeah. Because 
We have to become that embodiment, right? And, and so much of capitalism and white supremacist culture abstract us away. And, you know, we even come to conferences like this, sit at nice tables and take in abstract information. But the truth of our reality is embodiment. It's in the response and call. This is what the black church does so well, right? Call and response, singing, clapping, not coercively, but inviting people into a different reality, a new shared reality, a beloved community. Remember, it's the original BBC. Um, I'm going to finish here in a minute because my time is slowly running out. Uh, thankfully, I see a clock now. <laughs> um, I'm a, if you know anything about me, like I already mentioned, I love Marvel. Um, but what I love more than Marvel comics and anything else is Star Trek. Yes, nerds! Ah, nerd alert! I love you, nerds. Star Trek nerds are the best. We're a weird bunch, but we are the best. But you know why Star Trek, what makes Star Trek so great, right? Like, it's not just cool sci-fi adventures, weird aliens, and planet of the week. What makes Star Trek great is this ideal that they perpetuate, which is really almost like beyond socialism. <laughs> like, if you really research Gene Roddenberry, like, he was politically radical back in the 1960s, right? He created the show and put, you know, all these people of different ethnicities working together in what? A cosmic beloved community. Alien life with human life. He had Russians next to Asians, next to black people, next to white people. Like They were all together. In, the 19, in 1964, that was radical on TV, right? One of the first interracial kisses on television came on Star Trek, you know? And now if you look at the new Star Trek, it's the queerest thing ever. <laughs> Have you seen Star Trek Discovery? <laughs> There's like five queer characters on there. There's a lot of bisexuals, some Puerto Ricans, some gay Puerto Ricans. They're black, too. We, qu we claim it. You know, it's a black woman leading the ship. You know, Strange New Worlds is queer, too. There's queer people in there. I think Spock is the queerest character. That's another topic for another day. Come on. I hope they make him bisexual in the new Strange New Worlds show, right? That's my, my, my hope. But I will say, uh, Spock, speaking of Spock, there's this phrase that Star Trek came up with called IDIC. It's another acronym, and it means infinite diversity and infinite combinations. That the cosmos represents infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And the question is, will we see that as beautiful, or will we run from it and regress from that and think of that as something to be afraid of and to other? So many of you represent infinite diversity and infinite combinations, even within your families, within your schools, within your neighborhoods. You represent the hope of something that's yet come. You represent a reality of a kingdom of heaven that is still not quite here. It's he's here and it's not here. It's something we're moving towards. Queer people, you're moving towards a beloved community. You're not moving towards isolation, separateness. And I'll be honest, I, I support, I'm a leftist politically. I come to consider myself a pragmatic leftist. I call myself a Kamala Harris Democrat. <laughs> Let them with ears understand. <laughs> And I struggle sometimes with leftist culture. I really do. Sometimes it's just languaging, right? But what I struggle with probably the most is because of our trauma, we sometimes create barriers to understanding. Let's be honest. And that's all right to a level. It really is OK. If that's where you're at, that's where you're at. But know that that's not where you're always going to be, that we're moving towards belovedness. We're moving towards a beloved community where you might be able to, Jesus, the psalm says, I have prepared a table for you in the presence of your, I'm telling y'all, y'all either got to be Christian or a leftist sometimes, right? Sometimes they coalesce and come together, but sometimes they don't. I agree, you know, marginalized people shouldn't have to teach all the time and teach everything, but guess what? As a Christian, you're also a reconciler. Some of you have gifts of teaching. Some of you are influencers and you're teachers and you're prophets and apostles, and, and you're going to have to maybe do that work. The Apostle Paul literally said, I am the doormat in which the Jews walk on. Yeah, I'm willing to lay down my life so that others come into the revelation and the knowledge of the Son of Man. Because guess what? This is all moving towards beloved community. Paul knew that. He knew that identity was just a starting place and not a finishing place. It doesn't mean that we become this same homogenous thing with no differentiation. No, it means our differentiation illuminates what we share together. It's both and. And I think sometime in our culture, we do this thing where either we emphasize all the sameness and then, or we hyper uh, uh, talk about our differentiation. 
And I think both matter. We got to bring both together because when we bring both together, it creates novelty, surprise, a new thing gets born. And the thing I've been feeling lately is while the push for racial justice, uh, uh, sexual justice um, has been so powerful in the last number of years, it's still not enough. We've got to move into places of persuasion. We have to learn to persuade people and not just yell at people. And I'm the guy that yells at a lot of people on Twitter. I own it. I acknowledge it. I have done it. I have repented. I'm, I'm doing better every now and again. I will yell at an MSNBC journalist, but I promise I am, I'm repenting right here, right now. <laughs> I'm literally blocked by an MSC, MSNBC journalist for that reason. <laughs> he needed it. He needed it. That's all I'm going to say. And the third step to belovedness, which is what I've been talking about, community. Are you willing to be in community, even with people who believe different, look different? Are you willing? Are you willing? If you're willing, give me a head nod. So my prayer tonight, and my prayer moving forward in the years to come, because this is a, a decades thing, my prayer is that all of us here tonight will begin to ask tough questions of each other, that we do interrogate identity and queerness and, and what that means in the world, but we do it to bring in beloved community. And we do it not to isolate and not to stigmatize even our own selves, but we do it to usher in a new reality that people of all races, tribes, and tongues, if it's Revelation 4, right? Every nation, tribe, and tongue on the sea of glass, worshiping. Whether that's literal or metaphorical, I really don't know. But I know that there's this vision that I can't let go of, and it's the vision of building beloved community. Thank you.